Next up, we have uh, Henrique. Is that how you pronounce it? Okay, good. Um, who is kind of a Wonder Woman, if you ask me. She is CEO and founder of um, Logica. I'm not very good at um, foreign words, but uh, which is based in Copenhagen. Um, she also teaches, um, she has a, a master's in game design and she teaches user experience, uh, prototyping, game development um, to game design students um, in Denmark. And she is gonna talk to you about uh, edutainment and educational games and what's going on there. There's gonna be a break uh, after this one for five minutes, fingers crossed. Um, so yeah, I hope you enjoy this one as well. Thank you. Okay. Ah, okay, you guys probably really badly need a break, so I'll try to make this a little bit entertaining as much as I can. Um, my talk is called uh, Edutainment is Dead, Long Live Educational Games. And um, um, just um, already been introduced, but I'm just gonna say it again. My name is Henrike Lode and I'm a German living in Copenhagen. I'm the CEO of this company called Lohika. Uh, the games we scratch, it's just Lohika, that's uh, Filipino and means logic. A small Copenhagen-based game studio that employs uh, five people. And um, I'm also a game designer and an artist. Oh, that's beautiful. Uh, <laughs> working on this puzzle adventure called Machineers. I'm gonna tell you a little bit uh, more about it in a moment. I'm a um, teacher for master students at the uh, IT University Copenhagen for a course called Game Development at the moment. Or oh, it's pretty much finished now. And um, I'm also executive board member of IGDA Denmark and as such co-organizing the Nordic Game Jam, one of the biggest game jams in the world. How many of you have known it and have been there? And like, okay, no, you should come. Um, it's like, I think this year was 515 people. Um, Yes, and um, Bram invited me uh, to, to give this talk, practically begged me. Where's Bram? He's not here. Anyway, <laughs> um, and he um, it pretty much left it up to me to decide what I was going to talk about. Um, and I've been talking a lot about my game, Machineers, and um, now what, it's a learning game, so kind of what it takes to, to make a good learning game, the design principles. But the more I talk about it, the more I realize that um, yeah, people don't necessarily um, are ready for those kind of talks yet uh, because they still think educational games suck. Who here thinks educational games suck? No one. Is anyone developing educational games? <laughs> okay, one. <laughs> cool, so there's lots of good <laughs> stuff for you in this one. Um, so I figured I want to spread a message a little bit more before um, I can talk about why those things are important, and that is Edutainment is dead, and if it's not dead, uh, it should die. Very gruesome death. Um, I want to tell you why edutainment is bad, why you shouldn't make edutainment, uh, why you shouldn't play those games or promote them or believe in them. In case you can't tell whether I'm joking or not, uh, trying to do this sarcasm thing, uh, so just take everything with a grain of salt. All right, before we dig into all this hate that I brought all the way from Copenhagen, uh, maybe we should clarify what we're talking about. What is edutainment? It's pretty simple. It's a combination of two words that sound more fancy if you combine them. You have uh, education on the one hand, you know, all the stuff that we're trying to beat into the tiny humans while they're young and naive and helpless. And then we take entertainment on the other side, which is... Oh, that's the stuff that the kids like to do uh, in their free time instead of school, like watching movies, listening to music, uh, playing video games, and then we smash them both together, and there we have it, the perfect trap uh, to make them, uh, to fool them into thinking that they're enjoying something that they know for a fact can't be fun. Uh, edutainment, there we got it. And there's another cool invention that we have that we've been coming up in the last couple of years, and that's gamification. And that's the word that no dictionary knows how to spell. It always gets autocorrected to spell ramification. Those things are completely different. 
Um, ramification, it's also nothing to do with Rami, <laughs> um, is a complex or unwelcome consequence of an action or event. Say, if you're trying to educate children and you tell them it's going to be fun and they don't believe you and they, think, uh, they ask you if you think they're stupid, that would be a ramification. So that's, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about gamification. And uh, to make it a little bit more clear, um, uh, this is an example. You take something that's really boring by itself, like washing the dishes, and then you use elements from games to make it more fun. Um, so you could turn this into a competition, for example, or a race. You could um, award points to it and have a winner, and that winner can level up and earn privileges or get ice cream or something like that. And in theory, this works slightly better than the whole edutainment disaster. And there are a few game designers that uh, have been coming up with some great ideas on how to make this good. If you know anything about gamification, you know Jane McGonagall. Uh, she wrote the book, uh, Reality is Broken, and she's given many fantastic talks like her uh, at least one TED talk. She's um, inspiring people to do a lot of good stuff and has uh, designed some of the most fantastic gamification titles I've seen. For example, Super Better. That's a game for people uh, who are very sick and I set them small, uh, small goals like hugging somebody or going for a walk uh, and they build up resilience uh, and get stronger. That helps with their rehabilitation. So the problem with that is um, that it creates a big media bus. And then when people talk about making educational games and how game games can be used for good, I, I hear that they copy her words all the time and they state their statistics and they say stuff like epic win. And um, I think when people do that, they lack the proper motivation and information behind what it takes to make something that is entertaining and educating at the same time. And it leads to people making a lot of crap. <laughs> Uh, there's a lot of educational funds out there that support this, and um, so uh, people used to just slap this um, gamification entertainment stuff on top of their titles and uh, use it to make money. And uh, I'm really scared of meeting the people who made this because I'm constantly bashing their game. This is uh, Zeus versus monsters, and uh, you can already tell from the screenshot how it works. You're playing Zeus, who's standing on the one side of the screen with his finger in the air, uh, and there's this monster slowly walking towards you, and you have to solve this very complicated math task uh, in order to beat them. Um, and <laughs> I have another fantastic example. It also tells by the screenshot kind of how it works. It's a spelling game. Um, so the robot points at the sign that you have to spell and you have to rearrange the things in the right order on the train and it's probably going ka when you did it right. Um, as, there's lots of great spelling games out there, but this is not really one of them. And this, uh, I got a little bit lazy in my preparation for the talk, so um, I picked the screenshot uh, just basically uh, Googling uh, edutainment. I have no idea what it does. Uh, but that's, that's one of the pictures you can find. And you can kind of notice that there's something similar there. They all kind of have the same color scheme. And I, I, could, I could keep talking about bad examples of educational games. There's an insane amount of them. You probably have seen lots of them. They blindly force the uh, learning content together with some uh, popular game mechanic. Uh, but I don't want to talk about it anymore because it's very depressing. And maybe you're sitting there and asking yourself, so what the fuck is the problem? They're making something really nice and they're um, trying to make learning more fun and it's more fun than it was before, right? I'll, I'll tell you what the problem is. <laughs> Edutainment is a chocolate covered broccoli. When you're giving this to a child, the child knows immediately that you think they're stupid. <laughs> They, this, the same kind of feeling they get when they're in class and where they're not really knowing the right answer and when they're trying really hard and they're not getting it, it's the reason they give up. It's uh, the reason they develop hatred towards school and towards certain subjects or certain teachers. It's because they feel stupid and they don't want to feel stupid. No one wants to feel stupid. Uh, we're trying to avoid really hard situations in which we could fail because we're trained to do that. We don't want to deal with problems that we have never dealt with before because um, we might fail and that feels terrible. And we, we avoid experimenting or trying out new things. The risk of failure is just too high and when we fail, our, self, um, our sense of self-worth crumbles. 
But for some weird reason, in video games, the good kind of video games, uh, kids are willing to do all kinds of things that we ask them to do in school, but they do it voluntarily. Uh, and they solve problems that they wouldn't have if they didn't play those games. So they're putting themselves in the situation where like, all of us do. And they, they do stuff like sitting still for hours, focus, listen, memorizing what they, uh, what they hear, what they see. They, they go online and they seek additional information. They form communities. They share their passion, information. They educate each other. And they deeply care. And uh, they, for example, uh, also develop an opinion and they start arguing for it, uh, having analytical discussions. They learn voluntarily. And I have a dream that one day, <laughs> Educational games will do the same thing, and I have a few indicators that uh, could show that, and that is, for example, Minecraft. And I don't, oh, that's also beautiful. Uh, well, I don't need to show you a picture of Minecraft. I'm sure you're all aware of what it is. It's technically not a game, but a simulation, or it will, some people might argue that. Uh, it's a sandbox for engineering. Um, you create your own mission and goals, and it doesn't really explain anything to you. It just throws you in there, uh, not even presenting high quality graphics, uh, but it gives people the freedom to create their own world as an engineer. That's just fantastic. Um, I don't know how many people are aware of this game, Dragon Box. Not so many. Uh, this is an algebra learning game, and it teaches the player the playfulness of math. Um, who of you hates algebra? Uh, probably more, but um, so, and you don't know this game, so most likely you're not gonna believe this. Uh, I also I have it with me, but you sh and it's it's kind of expensive, but you should try it anyway because um, I guarantee you, in two minutes you'll get hooked, in 20 minutes you'll be obsessed with the game, and in 40 minutes you will love algebra. It really works. And um, as another example, of course, I have to do a little bit of self-promotion. Um, this is my game, Machineers. It's an episodical puzzle adventure. Uh, you repair machines and build vehicles and stealthily learn how to think like a programmer. Uh, and it doesn't use code uh, or words. It doesn't use any of the terminology of computer language, but it plants a metaphor in, um, in the player's head for how simple programming structures work and how they can be combined to create more complex uh, programming structures uh, or uh, problems. And uh, it teaches something that is called procedural, li procedural literacy. And that means understanding how complex processes work and how you can create your own processes. And you're not going to know that that's what you're learning when you play this game. So far, uh, it's won two awards from the, uh, from the uh, uh, academic, academic world <laughs> and the industry. I'm not an academic. <laughs> Don't know how to pronounce that word. Uh, we've received f seed funding from the Danish Film Institute, and now we just uh, started uh, with a real investment from a company called Capnova, and we're planning to release the game in September. I have it with me uh, if you want to play it, or if you have an iPad, you just email me, and I send you a test flight build in a few weeks. Um, and yeah, talk to me about it. Um, done with the self-promotion? And there's, there's lots of other examples that I would talk about, but um, I'm running out of time, or will in the end. Like, um, you know, the Papers, Please has been mentioned, uh, Civilization, those kind of games. Um, and they're all educational games in a way, maybe not Minecraft, but they are used in schools. Uh, that is one is used. And they teach stuff like engineering, architecture, algebra, programming, in other words, extremely boring stuff. If you want to to get kids to engage with that kind of thing, uh, you can get them to enjoy it or to voluntarily do it if you promise them the body weight and chocolate. So how do they do that? Why are they so popular? Uh, they're commercially successful even, and some of them used in schools. And I believe one really important trick is to not call yourself edutainment, gamification, learning game, or any of those names. Because uh, we're still dealing with this big bias, and if I call myself, uh, or call my game an educational game, or myself an educational game developer, it's more likely gonna be bad for me, uh, and for, for the game. The thing is we can't, as educational game developers, and our games can't afford to be snobbish, and to pretend that they're better than other games out there, they have to be measured by the exact same standards. They have to be, um, 
they have to uh, not depend on their decorations, on the framing, or on the value for the people, on their revolutionary approach to learning. They have to be fun to play. That's a rule number one, pretty much. Um, and they encourage diversity. They, they encourage people being weird and different, and they tell us that they, we're okay the way we are. They don't judge us. And when people get passionate about those kind of games, it encourages them to become geeks, to form communities, to get really excited about the things that they have in common that separates them from, everything, uh, from everyone else. And um, they develop something that James Paul G calls um, islands of expertise. That's uh, when like a four-year-old gets really excited about dinosaurs and develops this crazy amount of knowledge based on this uh, particular topic. And uh, I want to quote Gabe Newell, uh, who said at the keynote of the Games for Change conference in 2011, I hate that a lot of people use the fact that they are targeting the educational market as an excuse for not working as hard as the people who are trying to build commercial software. And I agree very much with that. I think that's one of the key problems with uh, edutainment out there. Um, if, if you want to be successful as an educational game designer, you have to first make a really good game, which is hard in itself. And you can't really lean back and be satisfied with what you came up with. You always have to um, improve and work hard on what you're doing. Um, I think that good game design doesn't just mean coming up with some clever idea, but uh, it's, it's very hard work. It takes a lot of balancing, experimenting, prototyping, and making sure that you optimally guide the player to have yeah, the best experience. It's really easy to, um, to fall into one of those things that um, if the game's too hard, the player will feel stupid, and if it's too easy, the player will feel like the game thinks they're stupid. Um, so what you want to end up with is a really smooth experience uh, that works for all kinds of different people. So that is kind of the challenge. I don't really have a, um, a formula on how to do that. It's hard work and experience, I think. And generally, those kind of games and games, yeah, educational games, but all kind of games, I think, are not really there to make you rich and famous. They're not really there for you. They're about making something for the people. It's about making the life uh, of the tiny humans easier and better and more fun, making them smart or feel smart. And um, uh, we'll, we'll make mistakes while we do that. We're not perfect, and the games we make are not perfect, and people will kind of hate them, but that's, or yeah, have criticism on them, and um, that's not our fault as designers necessarily. That mean, doesn't mean we're stupid. It doesn't mean the player is stupid. It just means we still have to keep working on it. It's not about us. It's not about taking it personally. Um, and that is pretty much my message. Thank you. All right. Well, um, we're going to have a quick break. So just grab a drink, grab a bite, hug a loved one. Uh, five minutes, we'll be back at four.